Hi there, welcome to this month's uh, practice clinic live, um, coming to you from Wimbledon. And what we've got in front of us here, what I've got in front of me here, is a bunch of uh, questions sent in by Online Academy subscribers about practice related issues in their pieces. So before I start, it would be great to, you know, just see a wave or two. If anybody's out there, please do um, press all those like buttons and let me know where you're calling in from. And if you feel like adding any comments as we go along, please do. Uh, I can see that Claire and uh, Anna uh, are watching. That's lovely. And um, others will join us as we go along. Nice to see you. Yeah, now we're coming. Um, people are, are starting to come in. So why don't I just get started with the first question, which comes to us from Finn who says, I'm having trouble with bars 86 to 89 in Mozart's F major sonata K332. The trills are tricky to coordinate with the left hand, and I would love some practice suggestions for bringing this section up to speed. Well, let me see if I can help you a bit with that, uh, Finn. Uh, the, the sonata that Finn's talking about, it, it, it's, it, for me, it's a kind of circus piece. It's got so many wonderful ideas. It starts off rather smoothly. <laughs> crazy and then we get a little bit of a minuet light so it's it's just so jammed packed with with contrasting ideas and really wonderful ideas um, but the part Finn's talking about is just at the end of the exposition when he's winding up the section and waving the flag for C major the dominant key and he has to be in the dominant key um, officially uh, by this point in the sonata and, and often what happens when composers get there is they kind of celebrate it with trills and arpeggios and scales and all sorts of fireworks. So if I play a little bit from before bar 84 <laughs> Is a twofold really. Uh, one is getting the left hand working well, the trills themselves, how to man, how to finger them, and how to then coordinate it with the other hand. Um, do we use pedal? Yes, I think we need certainly need some pedal here. Just let's. My, my mind seems to be going to the left hand first. What I would do with the left hand is what I would avoid doing with the left hand, and actually there are several ways of doing it. What I would avoid doing is locking the hand in the fixed position and, and, and playing like that because that feels already, even after two beats, kind of tight and not very well coordinated because I've got, you know, I'm, I'm sensing my fifth finger feels kind of weak and my muscles are starting to tense up. So the, the several things I, I would prefer myself, my circle, does is it, it's generated by the arm and the fingers are joining in with the arm and it just in terms of the exact choreography if you can see here what I would think of is the pinky is lifting up coming up and then round so that the thumb comes down thumb is your lowest point so. and what happens then is I if I keep my wrist very flexible I've got what's known in the in the business as a wrist circle uh, and that can happen very fast so in, in terms of practicing that I would stress the different uh, notes as, uh, in other words let, let me try let me start that sentence again I would first of all accent the pinky finger and then go back over it with with the stress now on the the next finger up which is the the fourth finger mostly with, with one third finger. And it, it gives each note the chance to be the leader of the group. Now the second finger. So three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two. Feels 
different with each accent. And now the, finally the thumb. So that would be the movement I would use in the left hand. You could, if you wanted, just use a lateral movement. Just side to side. That works well as well. You could also explore a rotation between the thumb and the five. That would work also. So I, if I were you, I'd experiment with each of those and see which one has your name on it, which one feels the easiest to you. Now the trills in the right hand, I personally would finger them three, two, three, two, one, two, five. And the same for the next one. Now, in terms of fitting them together, that's all very well to practice two for the price of one. So what I would aim for in my slow practice would be see how that fits together. It actually fits neatly together. The problem with that is when it's fast, we can't always control, we can't always hear the, the speed of the notes of the, of the trill. So there's another way that I'm going to suggest um, it's, it's a kind of cheat trill in a way, but it works really well. It's one of those magicians, you know, have sleight of hand that they do. So they pull rabbits out of the hat, but we know that um, the rabbits uh, are somewhere else before they're in the hat. And when they chop the lady in half, um, they're not really chopping her. And we kind of know that, but it's sleight of hand. Um, this is sleight of hand. What we can do with trills is to put the two notes down together and then a little, a little bit of a vibrato between those two notes. So when I put that together, that was better. Um, I, what I'm really doing in slow motion is, is having the two together and then tremolo a little bit, very lightly, and then putting the tail on. And when that's fast, it creates the illusion of a very fast trill. Um, but it's actually much easier to play than if we measured them out. So I hope that gives you some ideas on that one, Finn. Um, the next question comes from Janet, who's learning Chopin's Nocturne number one, that's the B-flat minor, opus, opus nine. Please could you help me with the runs in bar four and the similar run near the end? I have avoided using the words trying to learn, <laughs> as you told us not to. Um, well, yes, the, the, the point there is if you say you're trying to do something, then you're, you're not actually doing it. So it's just a little kind of psychological trick there. Don't say you're trying to do something, just say you are doing it uh, and it's work in progress. Yes, the nocturne that Janet's meaning is the very first one of Chopin. the polyrhythm we've got a group of 11 I'm looking at the actually bar 2 the end of bar 2 where we get a group of 11 notes in the right hand against a group of 6 in the in the left now and then then we get a group of 22 which is 11 plus 11 so we could just say that's two groups of 11 the whole point surely of a composer writing um, unequal groups between the hands is to, so that the hands don't sound together. They only sound together at the beginning of each group. So here they synchronize and they're not together until here and there and there. So those are our anchor points. Now those anchor points are quite far away from each other. Um, so I've, I came up with a solution that I find works really well for me and my students, which is to make the uh, a triplet group. So in the in the group of eleven in the right hand, we've got one group of triplets, and then the remainder of the notes are semiquavers, sixteenth notes. Um, now, if we keep when we practice, if we move that around the triplet group, if we move it around, um, I'll, I'm going to show you because it's kind of complicated to explain. But I'm going to start off with a two against three, triplet, um, right hand, duplet, left hand. With me so far? And now just two by two. Uh,
triple edge. Now the next stage is to move that triplet group to the next notes. So I'm now going to start off with a group of two semiquavers, sixteenths. Now here's my triplet group. Back to the twos. Triplet. Triplet. Now let me shift the triplet yet one more place further, further on. Still got two more to do. Ah, I missed one. Let me do that again. There we go. Ah, I missed one again there. This takes quite a bit of concentration and there's me talking my way through it. But you get the idea. Let me just do the last one. group at the end. So what have I done? I've, I've practiced a bunch of precise versions, rhythmically precise versions of that passage in order to create now an imprecise version of the sort that Chopin had presumably intended. <laughs> Happening there is, is provided my anchor points are together there, the other notes come where they will and it, it's a kind of magical process that practice um, suggestion there because by the time you get to the end of the strict versions and you try the free version some kind of magic happens and it, it actually works really well you might need to practice it a few days in a row like that before you can uh, be happy that the result is going to flow for you I did a little experiment earlier this morning uh, as I was preparing for this. I put on a recording of, actually two recordings, um, on YouTube and I slowed the speed down by half and then by half as much again, so in other words quarter speed, just to listen to how a couple of great pianists handle that. Um, I could hear exactly where the left hand and the right hand came together or didn't come together. And it was quite an, uh, I was going to say an eye open, it was an ear opener to hear how um, varied the responses to fitting the hands together were from, uh, I listened to Rubinstein and then a Polini recording, both very different from each other. Um, and and I, I can't imagine that any of that was planned. In other words, how the hands went together were not planned, but it just happens. So strict versions leading to a, a free version, I think is the best solution to that. Well, at least it suits me <laughs> and other people that I've shown it to. The next question comes from Philip, who's working on Clementi Gradus ad Parnassum number one, and he has a question about the tempo. But I'd like to show you, first of all, that I got this from a car boot sale years ago. Um, you can see that the spine has been exposed to the sunlight um, and therefore has faded a bit. But the, the, the front uh, and the pages inside are, are untouched. And there's something a bit ironic about that, because there's an inscription here. It says, to Louis... An artiste may never be contented with his achievements. Even his moods must give way to practice. And it's signed by Gertrude and dated September the 8th, 1917. Um, interesting time in the history of the world there. Uh, I think, who is it? Louis has never opened this. There's no sign of anybody having practiced from it or learned from it. The pages are in pristine condition and I've still got that here. This is the one that... that um, Philip is talking about. I can show you now just to have a look at the page there. Uh, you can see that. So what we've got is a, an, a, a, temp, a question about the tempo. So, so Philip actually only wants to know about the tempo. The tempo is veloce or half note equals 80. What does it equal? 
Well, um, in my edition, it's it, a half note equals 60. So what you do is you'd set your metronome to, if you wanted to find that speed, you'd set your metronome to 60, and that would give you half a bar. So 60 would be something like, this is what they taught us um, at the Royal College of Music, how to find 60. <laughs> One higgledy-piggledy, two higgledy-piggledy, three. Say higgledy-piggledy between the numbers, and that's about 60. So this, this is a minim, half bar, half note. <laughs> triplet groups in there it would come out like that if you wanted to just double up the speed make it um, 120 uh, that would correspond to a crotchet beat or a quarter note beat so you could do either but, but just but you, Philip didn't ask anything else about the this particular thing but I do want to just say one thing um, about it that Clementi was an old school um, type of person I mean he was a one of the pioneers of the new fangled piano when it when it first came out so his methodology was based on the finger technique that came over from the harpsichordists and what they were trying to do and it even went up into the mid 19th century they were trying to strengthen the fingers when the when the pianos got heavier the music got harder and keyboards got longer what they believed for a long time was what we needed to just strengthen the fingers so we get a whole load of exercises and method books with strengthening, I'm going to put the word strengthening in, in huge parentheses there because we, nowadays we, we kind of know that we don't really need to strengthen the fingers. We need to coordinate what what we have here with the arm. So to to make a choreography up the keyboard that's that's more um, holistic rather than just separating the fingers. So I would say with any of these things. Uh, not that they don't have value, you've got to be terribly careful how you do them, because as I was looking at this, and I've never uh, explored this, I have to confess, um, I don't like all this holding down. Now this creates a horrible stretch, if you use this fingering, you could do that with a three. Now the next bar... which is a bit of a tension trap. Uh, you could easily get very tight in the wrist. So you'd have to do this in a way that avoided that tension. So if you found that situation in a real piece of music, I'm looking at bar three, you would catch the, the long note in the pedal and just release and come round. But the, the point of this is to build up chord shapes. So the philosophy behind it is actually good. I still would uh, recommend the idea of taking a chord apart. So if we had to play that chord, very helpful to just experience each finger. But notice what I'm doing. As I, re between repetitions, I'm just checking into my wrist. I'm not lifting my finger up high. I'm just releasing the key and then putting it back down again. Then I can do that in combinations of two fingers. Tap, tap, hold, check for looseness. And that's fine if I've got plenty of time to switch off and really check my body. But when I've got something that moves fast like this, um, you'd have to be terribly careful that you built up to it very, very gradually and really ask yourself, what value am I expecting to get out of this study? What's it going to do for me at the end? Bearing in mind that Clementi is responsible for the instruction to balance a penny on the back of your, our hand and play just exclusively from the fingers. May have worked very well for him in those days, on those pianos, with that kind of tradition. Um, but as soon as we come to the, to the piano with a, with a more modern approach to piano playing, we're going to be using movements that, that involve the arm. And so the penny is going to drop off immediately, and that's how it should be on our pianos. So that was a very long-winded response to your very um, direct question about tempo there. Uh, Chris asks, my, my uh, son Alex is currently learning Chopin's Waltz, Opus 69, number two. He's having a little trouble keeping the left hand even in terms of tone and was wondering if you had any tips on technique to produce the soft, even tone he is looking for. This applies to the piece in general. Well, let me, let me direct Alex directly. 
uh, in the hope that you might be watching now or maybe a little bit later, Alex. Um, th this is the, just for the benefit of other people, this is the waltz in question. in B minor, rather melancholic, I think, and um, just kind of gorgeous. So the left hand jumps that we have to contend with here, let me just show you the left hand. I'm going to do this without the pedal. I would recommend practicing the left hand when you practice the left hand. Do so occasionally without the pedal, just so you can really hear and really feel what's going on under your hand. So the, the first thing I would suggest doing would be to make sure that, the that you've measured the distance between the bass note and the chord, and the chord and the next bass note. Do you see what I'm doing there? I'm holding down my first note until such time as I'm ready to leave it. And when I'm ready to leave it, I move really fast, but to the surface of the keyboard. I'm not playing. I'm moving just to the top of the keys, and I'm checking, are my fingers in the right place? I noticed the first time I did that, my fourth finger was kind of off the edge of the black key. Um, so I didn't play it. No, that's still slightly over. So I've made a little bit, not quite enough um, contraction between four and two. Let me do that again. Measure it. Yep, happy with that. Now I'm going to make another measurement from the chord to the next bass note. So I move quickly, but not in a jerky way, just directly and quickly to the next note. Now just a little tip there. We've got a pinky note, uh, pinky finger rather, on a black key. Now, um, I'll show you my right hand so you can see. If I want to make sure I'm really secure on that narrow black key with my pinky, I aim to go at an angle rather than to, to, be, to be straight on, square onto the key. Because if I, if I go square onto the key, there's a chance I might slip off in either direction. But if I'm slightly on the diagonal, very slightly, I've got a much more secure uh, connection to my key. So when I go from my B minor chord to the C sharp, I, I bear that in mind. Now I make another cover from the C sharp. Yeah, I'm happy with that measurement. Back to the A sharp. And now I've got to come up to this shape. Actually, that was good, although I say so myself. Um, I practiced this a little earlier like this, so it's, it's had benefits already. And now back down to the B, back up to the B minor chord. So all of those measurements are precise now in my hand. Um, they weren't when I started this morning with that. I just spent the 10 minutes actually practicing like that. And I can feel the results now, somewhat later in the day. That's one thing. Now the next thing I would do would be, I call this springboarding. What I'm going to do now is to use this B as a springboard to the chord. So what that involves is sitting on top of the B, on the surface of the B, and when I'm ready, I jump off it, up, down. Now, if you're worried about being tight or if you're not aware whether you're carrying tension with you, practice just coming up and landing in your lap, up, down. Hit release, completely free the arm. So what I do is I land in the chord. Now, if there's a chance I may get that chord wrong. Let me deliberately make a mistake. Now my first response is to correct that mistake, isn't it? You probably find yourself doing this. But what you haven't given yourself an opportunity to do is to learn from that mistake, meaning all I'd say to myself is, ah, I use my third finger instead of my fourth finger. See if I can think about my fourth finger now. That's good, happy with that. Now make another uh, springboard from the B minor chord to the bass. See what's involved in that? Um, that's, those are two sides of the same coin for me, but I'm going to show you something else that I find very helpful, which is I'm now going to convert the, the one, two, three pattern into a one and two, three pattern. And on the and, I'm going to land on a selected note of my chord. The bottom note, and I'm going to hold on to that note through the bar. Let me do that now with the middle note. One and two, three. Now the top note. Now the outer two. 
two notes. The upper two notes. Do you see how that works? So you can use that for the, um, the, the, the with all combinations of single notes and then pairs of notes if you want to go through that systematically. This rhythm is useful. Short, long, short, short, long. That really helps us to feel squarely grounded on the, on the chord after the jump. So having done that, I would practice now with three different types of pedaling. A, a legato pedaling. And now I pedal where the release is on the third beat. pedaling where the release is on the second beat. Down, up. Because even though we do find pedaling in, in this score, I think when we're playing a piece like this, we don't want a kind of recipe, like a generic pedaling for the whole thing. I find when I get to here, I want slightly longer pedals because the harmony is a bit more intense. And then... version of this because it comes back so many times I may decide that I want a, a different pedaling uh, on another occasion so the to, to come back to your question there Alex so even in terms of tone um, evenness in terms of tone depends on your technical command of the distances in the hand if you're tightening up or not moving quickly and directly from one position to the other you'll notice that you create accents uh, even though you don't want to, because the, 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 I call these my servants. These finger servants need a little bit more discipline, a little bit more training. And in the final analysis, what we want is a little more right hand. So I would imagine a dynamic marking perhaps of metta piano for my right hand and perhaps pianissimo for the left hand. If you add together metta piano and pianissimo, what do you get? Piano. Um, so as long as the right hand's singing out and the, the pedaling is organized and you've got your distances organized, you should find that that helps you on your way. I hope it does. And the next question is from Simon, who's, and the last question, in fact, from Simon, who's struggling to coordinate his fingers in Grieg's Butterfly, that's Opus 43, number one, um, specifically in bars seven to nine, I end up feeling very tense and dissatisfied that my playing is lumpy and out of control. I would appreciate any help you can give me here. Well, okay, Simon, be happy to um, give you a few thoughts anyway. Uh, the Butterfly, this is a charming piece. It's... Um... <laughs> that Simon's um, asking about is here. I could have done that better. Yeah, I'm going to, I'm going to put these notes in brackets here. Because I want to hear that C sharp <clears throat> going through. Now, let's just have a little look at that right hand. So in order to make that uh, comfortable, we need to use motions that are rotational because the pattern kind of dictates that. So when you go to your pinky and the, the other finger that plays with the pinky, if you could make sure that your palm, I've got an, an imaginary eye on my palm here. And when I go to my pinky, I'm looking at a spot on the floor to my left, each time. There it is again. Now I like a 5-3 there. Now you'd have to go in at that point and then back out again. Do you see, when I put my thumb on the black key there for the F sharp, I've got two choices. I either twist my wrist round to reach that way, which is, don't do that, because that's gonna tighten you up. And sometimes when we've got one little tension moment like that, it, 
it's hard to just get rid of that tension. It's not a very skillful way of doing it. The better way is just to lift up and move in. Can you see how I'm using 5-3 to slide? And that way I can keep my wrist in, in good alignment with my, uh, well, my hand in good alignment with my forearm, which is what we want. So for practice, I would recommend perhaps going back and forth each cell, each group, until you feel kind of lubricated. The other thing to do would be to stop on the top note and just feel that that motion is, is very free. So when I land on my pinky or the pinky side of my hand, just spend a second there, just checking that you're completely free here. The hand is free. Now with, with the next bar, oh, well I have, actually haven't quite finished. I would also um, unpack the, the voicing a little bit. Just go to the top note, then go to the lower note. top two fingers is kind of two voices. Shifting the accents is helpful. And in the next bar, you've got a couple of choices here. You could either continue to rotate in the right hand. I'm smoothing the rhythm out. That's a useful thing for practice. It's eventually going to be... But sometimes practicing equal rhythm could help you because you spend a little bit more time on the uh, upper pair of fingers. Um, what was I going to suggest? You could either continue to rotate there, but if you want, hinges, wrist hinges also would work well there. Very gentle. So I think that's probably all I was aiming to, to, to share there. But do a lot of right hand practice by itself. Don't just, don't put it always together. Do it without the pedal as well until you're really happy with the mechanics of that. So slow practice is useful to start with, but build it up maybe in chains. And then you could chain note by note. And then, and then. So what I'm doing there, just adding a note each time to the chain. Um, that seems to be it. That's the last question. We're done. So thank you so much for sending the questions in. Thank you so much for sitting there and, and watching this. And I hope it's been of some interest and some use to you. And I will see you next month for the uh, October Practice Clinic. Take care, everyone. Keep well.